This is the lecture for Chapter 4, but first let me introduce this unit. We're going to look at the macronutrients, carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins, and we'll touch upon things like diabetes, heart disease, world hunger, and malnutrition as well. But this lecture is a preview for Chapter 4. Again, the purpose of these lectures is to get you thinking about some of the important content in each chapter, to add some things outside of the chapter, and sometimes to give away some test questions as well. So chapter four covers carbohydrates. Carbohydrates include sugars, starches, and fiber, and that may be our one of our most important points. Carbohydrates aren't all good or bad. It's very important when we discuss carbohydrates that we talk about the type of carbohydrates because that makes all the difference to our health. You can read through these slides. They're posted at the end of each unit, so make sure you do and make sure you go into all of the links because I will not cover them word for word. But I did want to look at this image for a minute to prove my last point. These are carbohydrate foods, and these are foods that we want to have in our diet. Too often, people point to carbohydrates and say, that's too high in carbs, or she's eating too much carbs. Carbohydrate foods can be some of the healthiest foods out there, full of fiber, vitamins, minerals, fluid. It's the type of carbohydrates that becomes important. So you can look through these charts. These charts are not meant to show you the foods that are highest or low in carbohydrates. It is a common list of foods that's used over and over again throughout the text. There are some general takeaways, though. You can see clearly that the oils group has no carb. And in fact, cheeses do not either. And that may be a surprise to some because cheese comes from milk, but from the fatty part of milk. Milk and yogurt, on the other hand, do have carbohydrates. The animal protein foods have very little to none. And you can see just a tad in eggs, nothing in fish, beef, or chicken. So you can learn a bit of generals from looking at these uh, uh, charts. Okay, now this is where I'm going to hop over but tell you that you absolutely need to understand the different types of carbohydrates in terms of the complexity of the structure. So the single sugars, which they are, the double sugars, which are included there, and the more complex carbohydrates, including oligosaccharides and polysaccharides, and which are, are counted in these categories as well. So definitely look at that in your book. It's important to understand. When we look at fiber, one of the complex carbohydrates, the polysaccharides, fiber is very different. And its difference is the reason that we want more of it in most of our diet. It's not digested by human enzymes. Sometimes called nature's broom, fiber moves through our GI tract relatively um, intact for the most part, and yet has some very, very important health benefits. There are two major types of fiber, the soluble and the soluble fibers are very important for controlling blood sugar, um, bringing down blood lipids, and the insoluble fibers which have more of an impact on the health of the GI tract. You may wish at some point to sit down and think about the carbohydrates that you consume and whether they're sugars, starches, and fibers. That will get you thinking about the different types of carbohydrates and why we shouldn't lump them all together. Now as far as digestion, what our body wants from carbohydrates are, is basically glucose, okay, is the monosaccharide. And when we talk about how carbohydrates are broken down, the digestion, the chemical digestion begins in the mouth, okay? Not much happens as far as chemical digestion, 
although mechanical digestion occurs in the stomach, not much chemical digestion occurs. But in the small intestine, all of those different types of carbohydrates are broken down and broken down to the single monosaccharides which are absorbed and enter the bloodstream. Now one disaccharide that causes digestive troubles for really most people in the world as they become adults is lactose. So lactose is a glucose and a galactose bound together and what should happen is that lactase, the enzyme that breaks down lactose, breaks down that disaccharide to the monosaccharides and they are absorbed. But a lot of individuals don't have enough lactase to break down the lactose and then that disaccharide moves into the large intestine where there is uh, bacterial digestion, there's the production of gas, there can be cramping, there can be diarrhea, all sorts of digestive complaints. That's called lactose intolerance. Now for people who are lactose intolerance, it's intolerant, it's important to remember that most of us make some lactase. So you may just need to find your own tolerance level. And there are plenty of lactose free products on the market or you can get your calcium, vitamin D, riboflavin from other foods that are not dairy products. Fiber has a beneficial effect in the digestive tract. If you add it too quickly, you will notice that you may suffer from a bit of gas and maybe even things like diarrhea, but when you add fiber slowly and achieve a healthy level, you are nourishing your intestinal microbiota, the healthy microbes that live in our intestine, which is a very, very good thing. We'll talk more about that later. Nutrient absorption can be impaired at very high fiber levels. There can be binding of some minerals, for instance, but what typically occurs is when people are eating that much fiber, they're getting a very nutrient rich diet. So the impact on nutritional status is probably not significant. This is some of the research, very early research about fiber and GI functions. Take a read about this in your textbook, that's important. And let's talk about the health effects, my favorite part of this discussion. Don't forget to listen to the video bites. There can be test questions that are covered in these video bites, so it's worth your time. One of the things that we need to understand is how our consumption of sugars has changed over the years. And we are consuming less sucrose, okay, that disaccharide table sugar, and more high fructose corn syrup. But we are consuming a lot of added sugars. The first question we might want to ask, is that a problem, that we are consuming more high fructose corn syrup? It's a problem because it's more added sugar. But as far as fructose, fructose is what we're very concerned about. And fructose is found in both sucrose and high fructose corn syrup at about the same percentage. So too much added sugar of almost every type gives you a lot of fructose. And here is what we know about fructose, that it's handled differently by the liver and converted to fat, and therefore it can increase the lipids that contribute to heart disease. It can be stored in the liver, creating a fatty liver, and also leading to insulin resistance. Whoops, sorry about that. It can lead to gout. And something that's very, very concerning is it may alter our natural signals for fullness. So people who consume loads of fructose might not get the signals um, regarding when they feel satisfied. Take a listen to this video. This is very, very good. But you can see here that sucrose is half fructose, and that's really, really important to understand, and high fructose corn syrup, somewhere about the same. Here's another um, graphic that shows the same thing. 
Okay, not much difference. And by the way, for those using agave, which is a sweetener, it's even higher in fructose. People that were pushing agave because it did not impact blood sugar as much are now backing off because we know it's so high in fructose and we know that fructose is a problem. Take a read of this chart. I'm going to take a minute to go over it. Many people mistakenly believe that something like honey is healthier than sugar. So we're comparing here the different types of added sweeteners. Let's take a look. Honey versus sugar. Honey has more calories because it's a liquid and packs tighter. One extra milligram of calcium which is insignificant when compared to your need. You need a thousand a day a little extra iron, insignificant. Potassium, insignificant. And folate, insignificant. Honey is no more nutritious than sugar. Okay, it might have a few more antioxidants because of its production by bees, but it is not packed with antioxidants. So um, a sweetener, delicious, but again, it needs to be counted as added sugars. If you look down the list here, you see brown sugar, very little additional nutrients. Basically, brown sugar is white sugar sprayed with molasses, so no healthier for you. Raw sugar, it's added sugar. Molasses is the only one that comes with some significant values for nutrients. So for the most part, any added nutritive sweetener needs to be counted as an added sugar and it has the health impact of such. When we talk about the sugars in fruits, so sometimes we talk about naturally occurring sugars in an apple or blueberries, there are a couple of things happening here. Typically, the amount of sugar is less. It's still sugar, but the amount of sugar is less in the fruit and it comes with fluids and fiber and vitamins and minerals and phytochemicals. So a piece of fruit is a much better choice compared to something like candy. When we look at juices though, the story is a bit different. Okay, juices have are concentrated in sugar and you can see that here. All right, those are sugars and we have less fiber in the juice when compared to the fruit. The fruit is always a better choice than the juice. And one of the things nutritionists try to do is push, you know, big juice drinkers away from juice toward eating the fruit instead. We can easily consume far too much sugar and calories, by the way, from juice, but it's very difficult to do that from the whole fruit. So here's a list of some health implications of sugar. We're really concerned with this. We were led astray by some, oh, big corp, uh, food interests that kind of hid the information on sugar research for a number of years. And so we focused in on fat. And now we know that sugar has many, many health issues associated with excess consumption. Please read about this for sure. We are recommending limits in added sugars, not the natural sugars in fruits and milk, but the added sugars from 10% down to 5% um, from a couple of groups as well. And if you wanted to count how many calories should be coming from added sugar, it's much, much less than we consume. So take a good read of this slide, click into some of these links, and know that women, it's six teaspoons, about 100 calories, and men, nine teaspoons, 150 calories, children two to 18, same as women, under two, no added sugar. And this is far below what we're eating. A lot of our sugars come from beverages. If you wanted to convert grams of sugar to teaspoons, and this may be worth doing on your own, divide by four. 
Okay, so divide the grams by four and that will tell you how many teaspoons of sugar are in these different products. So you can see here that a 12 ounce portion of Coca-Cola has 10 teaspoons, which is above even the maximum that a man should get for the entire day. We are especially concerned about sugar sweetened beverages not only because that's where we're getting a lot of this added sugar, but because we do very poorly at limiting this. It doesn't add to satiety. Our brains don't kind of count it in. You drink a soda in the afternoon, you're still just as hungry for your dinner. Okay, but these are all of the diseases and conditions that have been associated with excess consumption of sugar sweetened beverages. So lots of links for you to explore and I would suggest that you do that. If you want to hunt down sugar, it's, a, it's getting easier, but it's a little bit difficult in the ingredient labeling because by using multiple sugar sources, we can kind of dilute the impact of this. But here are some tips for how to look for sugar in the foods that you're consuming, especially the added sugars. And again, know the math down here. Divide the grams by four to get the teaspoons. Couple of uh, informational slides on label reading. This is an example of this is sugar, but so is this, okay? And by the way, strawberry puree has a good bit of sugar in it too. So the sugars can be a little bit hidden in these labels. And option for individuals is a non-nutritive sweetener, sweeteners that virtually have no calories. Many of them come with health concerns though. The um, government has approved their use because the research shows that in the amounts that we consume them, they are safe, but some critics believe that they're not as safe as we would think they would be, especially for children, pregnant women, etc. At this point in time, stevia is the one that's probably looking the safest. And you can find pure stevia, you can find stevia um, as part of Truvia as well. And it's been given a green light by some of the groups that monitor our food. So here are some last tips on sugar. Read through these for sure. Okay, you usually don't have to worry about fruit. Most people, occasionally there's a diabetic that has a very hard time controlling blood sugar, but most of us are not eating too much fruit. It's the juices. So um, be careful uh, with focusing your attention on things that are not as important. Okay, and one of the good things about fruit is it's delicious. It can satisfy your fruit, your sweet tooth. Take a look at some of the products in your household and look at the amount of sugar in it. And especially if you know, for instance, if it's cookies, it's an all added sugar and divide by four to get teaspoons. The other type of carbohydrate that we need to spend some time on is fiber. Fiber has the opposite effect and we find it kind of in the opposite um, content in our diet, we're eating too little and it's very good for us. There is a list of conditions that consuming enough fiber lowers your risk for not only GI diseases and conditions, but a number of chronic diseases as well. So make sure you read the textbook on this. Soluble fiber reduces cholesterol absorption. Be sure to understand the mechanism for this, how this occurs. It can keep your bowel healthy, lessening constipation, diverticulosis, hemorrhoids, and epidemiological studies show that when we eat more of it, we have a lower risk for colon cancer. The recommendation is 25 and 38, 
women and men, and you should absolutely know these recommendations for the test. We're about half of that, and some people are much, much lower. When you do your homework assignment this time around, you will take a look at your fiber intake. Important to understand that to increase your fiber, you need to eat more fruits, vegetables, legumes, nuts, seeds, and whole grains. A lot of people focus in on the grains, but it's not only the grains that are good sources of fiber. If you do consume grains, you want them to be whole grain. So be sure to read in your textbook about how you know the difference between a whole grain and a refined grain. The whole grain has the whole kernel there. So you get the bran, the germ, and the endosperm. The endosperm is a starchy part that's left when that grain is refined. So when the grain is refined, you lose all of the nutrients. Because the nutrients are lost, the um, producers throw back in some vitamins and minerals, and we get our enriched grain that's still refined and still inferior to a whole grain product. So you want to choose whole grains. Do some reading about this. You can look for the stamp, but you can also learn to read your ingredients and translate whether that is a whole wheat. The first ingredient is this is not enriched wheat flour is that refined inferior flour with a th few vitamins and minerals thrown in. Read through the tips for increasing fiber intake. There's something for everyone. So if you don't like whole grain pasta, you can get extra fiber by eating more vegetables for snacks. If you don't necessarily like oatmeal, then you can certainly experiment with some international dishes that use whole grains and legumes. Take a minute to look at this slide and modify it to add fiber to it. That's an interesting exercise that you can do on your own and absolutely know the recommendations for carbohydrates. You'll look at these when you complete your homework assignment and you'll see them on the test. Finally, look at the cereals in your home and look for these recommendations. Try to determine if the cereals you and your family are eating are healthy or not. How much sugar is in? I usually say it shouldn't be any more than a teaspoon of sugar per serving. And you'll find some cereals that have much, much more. Are you getting a whole grain? Are you getting the fiber that you and your family need to be healthy? Check one of your cereal labels against these recommendations. So a little f fast, quick look at diabetes. There will be a couple of test questions on diabetes, and this is an, a very important topic. When we talk about blood glucose and blood glucose regulation, we often use the term glycemic index. Glycemic response and glycemic load are, are also terms that are used as well. They describe how the food you eat affects your blood sugar. So the white bread has a high glycemic index because your blood sugar shoots up after you consume it. The kidney beans have a lower glycemic index. We know that diets lower in glycemic index have a number of health benefits and you can read through them here. If you're interested in moving toward lower glycemic index, and this not only helps prevent chronic diseases, but can also keep you satisfied for a longer time, make you feel better, here are a few tips. White flesh potatoes are very high glycemic index. If you eat a lot of rice and pasta and noodles, consuming smaller portions is a great idea, but read over all of these tips. Now, you do need to understand the basics of diabetes. Please go to your slideshow and click into this link, which describes what diabetes is. 
you need to understand what insulin does, what glucagon does. So read through that. Your e-text actually has a number of animations that you can listen to. So make sure you understand that. And you need to understand the two different types of diabetes. We'll talk about gestational diabetes later. Type 1 is less common. It is an autoimmune disease. You can't prevent it, you can't cure it, but you can certainly treat it. Type 2 diabetes is more a lifestyle disease. About 90, 92% of cases could be prevented with proper diet, exercise, um, lifestyle factors. And we're seeing an increase actually in both types of diabetes, which type 2 is understandable because we've gotten heavier, kids have gotten heavier. Um, type 1 is a little bit of a mystery. We're not sure what is going on with that. We also see differences in different ethnicities, which is always concerning, but helps us focus our research and interventions. And we know a couple of things about diabetes. We know more than a couple of things, but we know these few things. We know that poorly managed blood sugar wreaks havoc on your body and can damage all sorts of systems, tissues, everything from nerves to eyes to heart to kidneys. Be sure to read about all these complications. We know that if you manage your blood sugar well as a diabetic, you greatly lower the risk of those complications. So that's very, very good news. That was uh, shown in a study called the Diabetes Control and Complications Trial. But we also know that most people with diabetes don't do a fantastic job at managing their blood sugar. So that's a, a task for you all to inspire them to take charge of disease management. We also know that type 2 diabetes can be prevented but we're not doing a very good job at modifying our lifestyle to prevent it. So read through the bit of information on diabetes treatment, go to the links for sure, and investigate diabetes in Philadelphia. We have some statistics that are concerning and we need to think about how we do curb this epidemic. Okay, so move on to the next part of your uh, Unit 2 module.